regarding this, just like for me, uh, just in case I say anything useful that I find useful and forget. Um, I was I was seem to uh, learn or like say interesting things every now and again, and I, I forget them because I'm not listening to them. So I'm actually saying them. So actually recording myself is is a good way to kind of see how uh, um, I like without the kind of risk of exposing myself to everybody else. Uh, not that I do expose myself to anybody else. I say. Anything ridiculous like that before? Um, and why is that going to be switched like that? Why am I going to switch like that? I want to switch like that. Why is that still there? You might want to get rid of your uh, any kind of announcements and things like that. sending you messages on Slack before you uh, start presenting. That is embarrassing and a great way to make yourself look stupid and make you feel nervous and, and even more anxious than you already are as well. Uh, right, let's get going. Uh, so thank you for coming along. I uh, appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedules to come along and listen to this. Uh, I try and make this as interactive uh, a session as possible. So I do have a number of slides as examples. and. But there are also discussion points, so feel free to um, you know, raise or add any kind of ideas that we've kind of uh, listed already about what you like about speaking, what you, what you want to do, what's holding you back, all these kind of things. And um, yeah, hopefully by the end of today, um, uh, if, you, uh, if you haven't spoken already, hopefully we'll get you in a position where you're thinking about wanting to speak, or if you haven't spoken for a while, if you haven't spoken since the last Closure X conference, then Hopefully it'll give you some encouragement to apply uh, to another conference and be able to speak there as well. Uh, I also want to encourage you to share kind of your experiences that you do have. Uh, if you've spoken either in public or even just uh, as part of a team as well, um, it, just doesn't, it doesn't have to be just my experiences. Um, I've been doing this for quite a while, but it'd be nice to kind of hear other people's take on things as well. Uh, so who's actually spoken already in some kind of class? Yeah, a or any, any kind of public speaking. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And who's spoken at a conference before? Okay, more or less the same people, almost the same people. Um, and who's never spoken before at all? No meetups or anything like that? Okay. Do people do uh, sort of uh, uh, like with their colleagues, work colleagues, like uh, little team meetings and stuff, lunchtime meetings? Do you ever do any of those kind of things? Right, let's get going. Uh, so this is me. Um, so one of the things I like to do is you know, help people find where I am, like give them a summary of what I'm doing. So this is just actually my uh, Twitter profile. Uh, I've just copied and pasted it. Um, because it's, it, I, and again, I use my Twitter profile to help people contact me in all sorts of different channels as well. I do, I do tweet quite a lot. Um, but yeah, it gives me some kind of information about me, uh, what I do, kind of who I work for, um, where, I, where I live, roughly speaking, obviously I don't give them my address, <laughs> any kind of strange people turning up, um, unless they're coming around to tidy my house up, that would be quite nice. Uh, and also kind of a uh, hint to kind of where my roots are as well. Um, and uh, also like other kind of sites they can contact me on as well. So if you want them to kind of come to my blog and hopefully read some of my articles and even uh, either like them, share them, or even uh, give some comments on them as well. That's always pretty cool. Uh, so it's nice to kind of have like a bio kind of introduction. Uh, and try and have this like consistent. It doesn't have to be very long. Um, when you're doing a uh, meetup, it's not that big of a thing. But if you're going for a conference, then people want to know why they want to kind of come to the conference. Why The bio is part of uh, why they should come to the conference, uh, but then also why they should come speak come and listen to you, you speaking as well, um, uh, as well as the actual talk. Because um, if you've got two talks that are a similar sounding uh, interest, but one is a much better speaker than the other, then you probably go and listen to a speaker that you you know or you like the sound of, 
that as well, so you kind of tip the bonus as well. Uh, so let, before we do the why speak, let's look at some of the things why why I don't want to speak in public. Uh, too nervous? Yes, uh, it's. Uh, I, I get very nervous. A lot of people, a lot of speakers do get very nervous um, when they're speaking. Um, my uh, my approach to nerves is to not think about what I'm doing, not think about the fact that I'm speaking up in front of a whole bunch of people who could like go and throw their spitfire at me. Um, <laughs> because if you if you think about the fact that you are public speaking, you will get nervous, and you'll get round, and then you'll know you're nervous, and you get even more nervous, and it can be a very vicious cycle there. Um, ooh, what's it say? It's a tiny, once I know a thing, I assume others do, others do too. So why would they be? Ah, nervous? yes, yes. So that, um, yes, yeah, so. This is kind of for me. It's like, well, I have I have nothing to say. In a nutshell, uh, I, I don't have anything interesting to say because mm -hmm. everybody knows everything that I know, mm -hmm. which is probably the biggest fallacy out there because most people don't know like hardly anything of what you know because you're fairly unique. What you're doing, where you're working, which I mean, even if you're if, even if everybody's doing something sim, uh, part of the same language, then they're they're using different aspects of it. They're building different things. Uh, even on a team, they've got different aspects and ideas that they share with each other, different experiences. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it's uh, hopefully I'll kind of cover some of that as well, some of those examples as well. Why would anybody want to listen to me? Yeah, it's, it is, uh, everybody kind of feels this way as well. I mean, when you're trying to, if you've done a whole bunch of talks, you think, well, I've, I've said everything I want to say, but then there's always kind of more ideas that come back. When you stop thinking about the fact that you've got nothing to say, uh, and you start doing stuff, you think, "Well, oh, that's interesting." And as soon as, you, as soon as you get to that point, "Oh, that's interesting," somebody else is going to be interested in that as well. It might be like five people, it might be five thousand people. You don't know, but until you actually put it out there, you're not going to uh, know for definite how many people are interested in it. I didn't know how many people were going to turn up to this workshop until I did it. So I did it, and I, now I found out. Uh, and I'm glad it's just more than just me. Too. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with Sam, but it would be very awkward for both of us if there was just two of us in the room. Um, mm. yes. Could have some more room. Uh, I'm not good at public speaking. Mm. Well, were you good at coding when you started? <laughs> were, you good at, yeah. were you good at speaking when you were a baby? Well, no, you weren't. Until you start doing more of it, then you're not going to be good at public speaking. But are you good enough? Are you good enough to be able to do something? Are you good enough to get started? Um, hopefully we'll kind of cover that, some of those aspects as well. I just feel anxious, yes, I mentioned that as well, we'll go into that in a bit more detail. Um, thinking the info you have is incorrect, inaccurate, yes. <laughs> People have obviously been to my presentations, so that's <laughs> what I'm thinking all the time. Um, and, and that's part of building up the, I think building up the actual talk itself gives you a bit more confidence. Uh, you find that, and actually giving the talk gives you uh, a lot of feedback in what you understand and what you don't understand. Um, when I've been teaching people, uh, things like closure uh, or teaching people at work, um, the stuff we do there, it's, it's not until I actually start talking to people or explaining something to somebody that I actually really understand whether I actually know it or not. Um, and sometimes I surprise myself how much I actually really know. Sometimes I, on a few occasions, I find out I really don't know something, and then at least I can go up and find out about that. And that's also kind of like uh, where you would kind of pitch the level of uh, public speaking you, you're going to do. Are you going to start off like, like a 5,000 person conference at a, at a, at with a topic you're not sure of? Probably not. You're going to probably start a little bit more gently and work your way up and build your confidence up there as well. Unless somebody's paying you to go and speak to 5,000 people. Presentation before covered everything. <laughs> yes, I was going to say uh, yes. Yeah, so somebody's just given a presentation. You're going to do one next, which basically says everything you're going to do. That's tough. Um, I think I've I've kind of been in that situation before, but luckily my presentation was quite long, so I just missed the first part of it off and did the second part um, and and got away with it that way. Um, so yeah, having some kind of backup uh, or having something else. You Kind of talk to if somebody basically just gives your talk. It's very rare, very unlikely. Some people might talk on the same theme and you never 
know exactly what they're going to cover. But um, yeah, having some extra examples or live demos and things you can pull out um, can I help it. I was going to write thinking the info you have is incorrect or inaccurate, and then Sam wrote it, so I had to think of another one. Okay, right. <laughs> nice, exactly. Good example. Good example, yeah. Um, yeah, so that, I, I think this is very rare, and like if it's a conference, then people would pull it up. If it was a meetup organizer, they would, yeah, it, part of the description that you're submitting, so whoever's organizing that event should pick this up, but it can happen uh, interesting. Uh, we'll try and see if there's any other ideas we can cover around that as well. Uh, I might look stupid. Well, yeah, possibly. I don't know. Am I looking stupid? Yes. I, I'm sure I felt very stupid at times. Um, possibly not as stupid as uh, somebody who was having a radio interview this morning and forgot all the numbers of the, of the costings they were trying to do on uh, how much a policeman would cost. Uh, but we won't mention any names there. Um, it's in the paper if you want to have a look. Uh, and uh, yes, there is always a risk of looking stupid, but so what? If you look stupid, I'm sure you've looked stupid before and other people at times have done things that are other people think are stupid. And I'm probably nobody killing for that. Uh, so it's not the end of the world. Um, and yeah, I, I do stupid things on a regular basis to so try and limit that, obviously. Um, but it, it's, it is kind of not thinking about that. Most, most, most audiences, even if you're stupid, um, say, yeah, he's just human, he's just a normal person. Because they do stupid things all the time, too. Um, so it's, uh, and audiences are, are really friendly as well. So even if you make a complete screw up. Uh, I remember somebody who's very well regarded as a programmer. Uh, she decided to update all her libraries the night before she gave her talk. And she's going to do a live demo. And she spent five minutes, uh, she spent all morning trying to get to work and couldn't get to work. Uh, and then basically just had to kind of say, sorry, I, I don't have a talk for you in front of like 100 people. Um, and she, yeah, she was embarrassed, she felt stupid, but, um, but everybody was really nice about it because we all know these things happen. So. Um, what if it's obvious? Um, I find all this stuff completely obvious, but then I've been doing it for a while, so um, most people, again, are, have a different experience, different background. Um, so you, you do have, but so you might, to summarize this, you do have something to say, everybody's nervous, anxious, Feeling that they might look stupid as well. Everybody, kind of, everybody, you know, speaking has all these kind of concerns looking at the back of their mind potentially. Um, so you're all in the same place. It's just some people have done more of this than you and, and have got more experience, so they're better at dealing with these concerns than you are in it potentially as well. So hopefully this will give you some confidence to address these and other concerns you may have. Uh, do you have any questions on that? Uh, so oh, let's make a bit of space and don't be afraid to kind of use the room. So it's good exercise, keep your own energy levels up. Um, I'm going to sit down here. Oh, so I'm getting old. <laughs> Saying that. Oh, let's see. Uh, yeah, and you don't want to sit and look at the slides while you're talking because that's pretty bad. So speaking benefits, career development. Uh, it's a good way to. Boost your career. Uh, it's a good way for other people to see you in action. Uh, if you're talking on a technical topic, then you, if you go for a job interview, then you can cite kind of the, what I gave a talk about this very question you've just asked me in this interview about at this conference, and this is what we talked about. And then you probably end up speaking more about uh, the conference experience than actually answering the question. So it's a good way to deflect uh, uh, interesting uh, interview questions as well. Hello, sit down. Have a seat. We're in just died, so you haven't missed too much. Uh, and learning more for me, I think this is the biggest benefit of, of speaking is actually learning stuff, learning how much you actually know, learning the things you don't know, as we mentioned. Uh, what if I say something that's wrong? Uh, well, people will tell you. Um, I've had things that um, I think one time I actually, somebody asked me a question. Uh, or it was more of a query saying, are you, are you going to explain this? Um, and um, I said, oh yeah, that's an interesting point. Would you, would you like to explain it for me? And they did, which was great, because I had no idea what, how to explain that. I kind of vaguely knew what it, what it meant. Um, 
but I didn't know how to explain it. And it was great to get their uh, input as well. So actually, yeah, giving something, preparing the talk is a really good way to actually learn uh, the, the material. Because again, if you can explain it to somebody, then you have a better understanding of that. And the more times you do that, uh, yeah, the easier it becomes to explain something. You find different ways to explain it as well. Um, if you explain it to more people, uh, everybody else has a different frame of reference. You try different ideas, see what kind of connects to them. And uh, yeah, it gives you a much better, a much clearer kind of way to kind of turn a lot, especially when you first start explaining something, it becomes very long you know, explanations. And if you do that more and more, you can kind of whittle down the ex extraneous things and just get to the, the nub of something uh, and explain something a lot more clearer, a lot more precisely. Uh, and also getting feedback from people as well. So uh, also with blogging, so with blogging or uh, like writing an article, uh, it, it's always nice to get some feedback, even if somebody's saying, oh, I do this, or I think this is wrong, or uh, having a discussion on the blog as well is a great way to do that sort of stuff. Um, people tend not to discuss while you're speaking, they might ask questions, but you tend to get a lot more feedback after your talk as well. So people will come up to you, um, most of the time people come up to you and say, thank you, it's a really good talk, really interesting. Um, and if they're using something like this, uh, if they, it's a topic that they're using at work, then they'll kind of might, might share what they're doing as well. Uh, and, and yeah, and, and they might kind of give you other ideas about, okay, yeah, that's really good, I'm going to try this. Uh, and it also gives you some uh, thoughts about what else you want to learn as well as you're actually preparing the material. Uh, and I do find conferences and events more fun when I'm doing this because like people know who you are, they come and speak to you, you know, just in the corner thinking, oh, I don't want to talk to anybody, I'm feeling shy. Whereas like with the, when you're speaking and then people come up and talk to you uh, as well. So it's um, occasionally buy drinks as well, which is always nice. Um, it doesn't happen very, very often, but it's uh, always a good thing. Um, and people will, will give you kind of um, a slightly elevated kind of level of experience, they'll, they'll assume that you they know that you know more than they do just by the fact that you're a speaker. Um, it, not everybody, uh, but people are just amazed that you actually get up there in front of X many people and actually speak. That they, they want to kind of ask your opinion, they want they want to know things. They're, they're more encouraged, more able to come and ask you because you're kind of like a, an expert or, or a raised to a slightly expert kind of level because you're a speaker. Uh, again, it depends on the conference, but typically people, yeah, if they really like your talk, they'll come and ask you stuff and ask you things beyond the talk as well. Uh, and that way that helps you kind of extend your understanding because they're asking things on top of the topics that you've just covered as well. Um, I gave a talk, uh, when was that, last week, at uh, ProgsCon, and yeah, it's about uh, functional reactive programming and people asking now about like the future of JavaScript and JavaScript whatever it is 2017 now and what these libraries are. So they're asking me questions beyond uh, the, the scope of what I was covering, which is great because it gave me a chance to non-committally kind of explore other areas that I wanted to cover in that topic as well. And it's, yeah, and for me it's fairly safe because it's usually only like two or three people I'm talking to at a time. So it's uh, instead of a whole audience of like 50, 60 people which is a bit more scary when you're kind of winging it, making things up. Uh, not that I ever do that. <laughs> yeah, do that. Uh, yeah, so that's a, for me, there's benefits. Uh, there's barriers. So I, I think we've covered some of these. So imposter syndrome, everybody gets this. You just don't think you've got anything interesting to say. Um, and it, it, is, it is tricky. I mean, at the start of this year, I thought, I, I'm not going to do any talks this year. I don't have anything to say. What I want to do, I've done about half a dozen already, and then a few more for work as well. So uh, yeah, that, that that never really lasts long enough because if you want to go to a conference, then you're probably going to come up with a talk. Uh, that's a that's a motivating factor of actually wanting to go to a conference. And for most conferences, you get a free ticket, you might get an invite to the speaker dinner, um, and uh, yeah, you get coming up and talking to you as well. So it's a, it's a benefit to go and 
So then it's a driver to go and kind of beat this imposter syndrome um, uh, that you don't have anything valuable to say. You, you think of something. Well, what do I actually like? What am I actually playing around with? Um, and so at the start of this year, I did a, I think about a two and a half hour workshop session on, on Space Max. Um, and that was like uh, a couple of weeks after I was thinking I didn't actually have anything interesting to say. And then I fired up Emacs and started playing around. But I wonder if I could do a workshop on this. I've been meaning to for ages. Uh, and yeah, and then you kind of you, you start putting something together, thinking, well, what, what would I actually talk about? And it kind of helps balance this imposter syndrome a little bit as well. You still feel it sometimes, but it, it's everybody does feel it. So it's like, I think it's for me, it's a matter of just moving on and, and, and actually getting something in your head or, or forgetting about it. And, and then you wake up one morning and think, oh yeah, I could talk about this. Um, uh, lack of experience. Uh, yeah, so I think that there's two things here. So lack of experience in what you're talking about and lack of experience in actually giving a talk. Uh, I think lack of experience of giving a talk is is a little bit harder to get over because it's what makes you feel more nervous. Um, actually, not uh, having experience in the topic you're talking about, you can just put the, the work in and yeah, learn it uh, and try it out and talk to people and ask people about questions as well, especially in a technical audience. It's very easy to like, ask lots of people, get lots of people's opinions about how something should work, especially on the internet. And so it's, um, it's, but public speaking is a little bit uh, trickier. You can kind of have to practice it. Um, and you kind of have to do it really. It's one of those things that you're always gonna be nervous until you actually really sit down or even stand up and do it. Um, and lack of time, too busy. Yeah, I'm always too busy. But then I still do too many talks a year as well. I think it's just, if you want to do it, submit your talk, you get accepted, and then you're committed to doing it, and then you just carve out time once you're committed. Really. So, um, it, it's it's very easy to put it off because I don't have time, but if you want to do it, then um, you, you always find the time to do it, even if you have to stay up late one night and finish your slides off, or tweet your slides in the morning, which I never do. So I never recommend doing that at all, ever. Uh, any questions so far? So I, I started, just going to go through this very briefly, so I started uh, speaking at university, I really hated it, um, I had to give a five minute <coughs> presentation that seemed to last for an eternity, uh, I still remember it very vividly now, um, and so it was on the, uh, you know, the clear sheets with the, the printed text on, with the overhead, proje pro overhead projector when it <laughs> actually had an overhead, uh, and uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was a bizarre experience. And I, Dreaded. I was like dripping with fear. I was I was scared out of my brains, and uh, and that was like three weeks in the run up before I actually gave it. I was I was terrified for three weeks about the fact that I had. To, every time I thought about the fact I had to give a talk, I, thought, I just don't. I like felt sick. I just really didn't want to do it. I didn't want to go up in front of 150 people and make a fool of myself, look stupid. I was nervous. I was anxious. I was all these things. Um, and so what I did was just spend, because we had to prepare these like slides, these acetate slides kind of thing, I had to spend uh, like uh, time writing them and, and like making sure that uh, what I was going to say was what I wanted on the slides. It's not like PowerPoint, we could actually go back and change them uh, last minute. There was no last minute changes to these, these things. And uh, there's no pictures I could use really, it was just text and stuff or, or very kind of line drawings. So like images you could get from Google to make uh, people, oh look, kitten. You couldn't do any of those tricks. Um, and so the way I got around was just doing the work and practice, practice, practice. I, I just went over for like a week. So I just continually practicing my talk. Um, I had, a, I had a, like a weekend job, um, a fish and chip shop, uh, preparing like potato, how you make the potatoes. You just put the potatoes in this big uh, machine that peels them for you. Which and while I was doing that, I was just practicing and practicing and practicing my talk as I was doing this kind of fairly mundane job. And even when I was like, I did some serving as well. So even when I was serving, I had the kind of all the slides I'd written out uh, and I was just practicing in between all the customers and stuff. 
because it was, and, and I was doing that all the way up to it, and even when, when I was like waiting for my turn to represent, I was just kind of reading over it. I wasn't really listening to what anybody else was saying, I was just reading slides over and over again. And I think I could have kind of done it without the slides by the time I actually gave my presentation. Uh, but I got up and did it, and, and everybody was, like, was really nice and said it was really good, one of the, one of the better presentations and stuff. But I, I thought it was terrible. I thought it was like the worst thing. I'm never going to do that ever again. If I have to have a job doing this, I'm never going to. I'm not. I'm never going to have a job doing this. And look where I am now. Um, I started doing consultancy, and then I, I kind of suggested I, I started giving training courses, and they ended up being five day training courses. That was five days worth of giving presentations. Uh, and some of these training courses were just slide after slide after slide after slide. Whether I actually trained anybody in anything, I have absolutely no idea, but they, they got free lunches, so they, they usually have. Um, uh, yeah, and then I just ended up giving lots of presentations to work. Uh, but I think it was not until I actually started doing the community stuff that I actually really enjoyed doing presentations and stuff. Uh, with the, like doing the, having that experience with work helped me kind of have that practice uh, of actually just doing it. So when it came to actually wanting to do something I, I cared more about, then um, at least I had that experience that I could kind of still battle the nerves to actually do it as well. But it was, yeah, the first few, I think I was giving the talks, uh, I think I gave a talk on closure about Ring, I, and I'm pretty sure I said pretty much all the things wrong. Uh, I don't think I really understood it that well. Um, but then I started doing talks uh, around the Agile community about Kanban and personal Kanban and all that kind of things. So and I really knew what I wanted to say and I felt a lot more comfortable about those kind of things because I understood or I had a good story I wanted to tell. Um, and that made it a lot easier for me to actually just get up and do it because I was just so focused on telling the story but also enjoying telling the story as well, which made all the kind of nerves kind of disappear. Um, because I was just kind of talking to my friends about something I really enjoyed. And if you get to that point with your talks, then a lot of these things do go away. But yeah, if you, if you start thinking about it, what you're actually doing, then yeah, you do get nervous again. I tend to avoid speaking to people too much before a talk because um, it kind of reminds me that I'm at a conference and I'm about to give a talk and they start asking me about my talk and I'm thinking, don't ask me about the talk so I'll like, it'll like, it'll mess my head up and I'll be here, then everywhere, and I'll, I'll, I'll not start in the right place and I'll be here all over the place. So I kind of like to keep myself a little bit of a quiet space before I really get started, especially at a conference. Um, and if it's a new talk as well, then uh, I try and kind of distance, distance myself. That was in a, in a nutshell uh, my brief speaking history. Um, so hopefully that's given you some confidence. Is anybody feeling any slightly less nervous and anxious about going and speaking? Maybe a little bit. Maybe not yet. Not sure about less nervous, but it's nice to know that I'm not alone feeling all those things. Yeah, and I think everybody does. Everybody does feel nervous and, and imposter syndrome. I was, um, I mean, I was speaking at the conference last week. Uh, as Trisha G, who's a quite well-known speaker in the, the Java uh, circuit, and she goes and speaks of Java One. She still gets nervous. She still gets imposter syndrome. I mean, we we talk about these things all the time. Uh, I'm not just saying this to kind of make it, it actually is real, uh, real things experienced by people who've been doing this for, even if people have been doing this for 20 years, still have this, but they've got more experience to deal with those kind of issues as well. And until you start actually doing it, then it's a lot harder to start dealing with these issues as well. So it's a bit of a catch-22. Uh, so I'm going to go through uh, a little section about, has anybody applied to uh, speak at a conference? Um, so I'm just going to go through these some of these a little bit. We get so we call cold papers. It's more traditional kind of name. Um, these are like scientific um, conferences where there'd be you write a scientific paper and then you go and speak at the conference based on the paper, and, you, and then you go and present it. So a name's just stuck for the development community as well. Uh, and so you go in there and. You need to create something, you need to write, provide, oops, you need to provide a title, abstracts, and usually a bio, so a little like, piece about yourself. 
And so uh, the title and abstracts are, going to are usually going to be defining whether you're going to get accepted or not uh, to the conference. With a, with a meetup, then you probably need to still give a title, abstract, and bio, but it's probably just that's the information for the meetup. You're already accepted because uh, people running meetups are always looking for people to speak. Hint, hint. Mm. Uh, and a meet the meetup's a really good way to get practice for speaking at the conference as well. Um, and so, yeah, coming up with a good title and abstract is, is useful for getting accepted. Uh, it's also useful for helping people understand what your talk is about, obviously. Um, and there's a bit of an art to creating a title and an abstract. Bio's, bio's fairly straightforward. You don't have to worry too much about what's in the bio. You just have something that sounds vaguely interesting, describes you roughly, uh, it's very straightforward. It's usually a title and abstract that's the, the key. And we'll cover those in a little bit more detail in a moment. How often should I apply? You should apply right now to the Closure X conference. Call papers are open, no pressure. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, you should apply as many times as you want to, really. Um, if you've got talks you want to give, then you should submit them. I think some conferences are starting to limit you to like three or four talks. Most people don't only spit in one or two anyway. I, for DevOps UK, I've, I've typically submitted about six or five or six. The only problem with doing that is if they accept several of them, that means a lot more work for you to do as well. <laughs> so by, by submitting more, you've got a potentially better chance to get accepted. But if they accept them all, well, you don't have to accept the fact that they've accepted them. But um, yeah, I, I feel a little, embar a little bit embarrassed to reject a talk I submitted if they've accepted it. I, I feel obliged to actually give the talk if they've accepted it. Um, so what's the most talks you've ended up giving at one conference? I think it's only, outside of work, I think it's only three. Only three. <laughs> but one of those was a, a quickie, so one of those was only like 15 minutes. Uh, the, the, well, so there's a 15 minute talk, a 45 minute talk, and a half day workshop. So it was quite, quite a lot. <laughs> That's not quite hard work. It was. <laughs> I, I kind of wished that I hadn't had the quickie, ironically. I could have done the, the talk and the, uh, the workshop, but the quickie was just, just a little bit too much. That extra 15 minutes, and plus they're all on like three different subjects. So, um, issue performance. Oh, uh, the middle one wasn't the talk; it was a bird of bird of feathers, which is even higher. It's like an hour of me trying to get other people to talk to each other about uh, the topic. In this case, it was a topic on Git. Just trying to get people to talk. To. So, we basically hired to, to speak. So, bird of feather, you're all in one room. The idea is you talk about that topic and where you want to go, what you're uh, like sharing experiences. And uh, so you usually have to talk for a little bit until other people start talking uh, and get them to talk and get them to politely talk to each other and not like violently disagree with each other. Uh, yeah, so so I think it's, so in a nutshell, it, it, you can apply as often as you like, but um, yeah, it, I think it's better to do a, a few good submissions than just kind of wildly do something. It's a bit like applying for jobs with CVs. I think I'd rather write two or three really good CVs uh, or write a really good CV and pass it to two or three companies and just kind of blitzkrieg like a hundred companies with the same, uh, same talk. Uh, but yeah, you can, uh, you can uh, um, submit the same talk to lots of different conferences, as many as you want. Uh, and people like that. I mean, if it goes down well, most people will go to one conference and probably aren't going to go to the other conference. And even if they do, uh, if it's a multi-track conference, they, they may or not have seen you already. So people, organizers are okay accepting like talks that other people have done already. Um, I mean, if it's on the same topic and it's in the same town and it's within the same month, then probably not, but the conferences are rarely like that anyway. Um, and you can spend as much time speaking at conferences as, you, as you've got. Um, some people spend all their time speaking at conferences as well. Um, I'm trying to minimize it a little bit because it, it is quite draining speaking at conferences, uh, especially if you're doing lots of different talks. Uh, if you're doing the same talk, it's not too bad, but you've still got all the travel and um, a 
wild parties and everything that you should <laughs> be go to. Um, yeah, so, there you go. Uh, so now we get on to a little bit of the mechanics. Um, so writing a good title. Uh, for me, that's, I don't know if anybody, does anybody blog, write blogs? Right. A little bit sometimes, maybe, dabbling. For me, that's the same as writing a good blog title. If you want people to uh, read your blog, they need to know why, and you get that from the titles. If you want people to come listen to your talk, then you have a good title that people know, because they're going to make snap decisions. Um, uh, when the organizers are going to like 100 talks, they're just going to look at the titles, and they're going to pick out the titles that mean something to them first, and they okay, let's go and look at the description. Oh yeah, that's nice, I'll accept that one. Um, I mean, we had a, I won't mention the person's name, but we had a, a very good speaker uh, who wasn't accepted to last year's conference because we kind of missed him off because they gave a kind of very average title and didn't really put in much of a description. But you know, there's nothing new there. I mean, and he kind of done that talk before, so we didn't kind of do it. So even, even a, a, a well-known speaker can kind of get missed off because they don't write a good title and have to write it. Uh, so a title should be to the point and clear, so it should really kind of sum up what your talk's all about. Uh, so um, when I did this uh, this e event, so it was the was it, uh, uh, first speakers, first time speakers workshop, um, uh, and then I put in the abstract that it didn't have to be, you don't have to be a first time speaker, but it gave people kind of immediate kind of idea about where it was aimed at, what kind of people it was aimed at, what kind of things they, they might kind of learn, or we learned to figure out how to speak. Uh, We've never done it before, so it kind of does say quite a bit in a very concise title, I hope. Um, and so typically I write down a whole bunch of titles and um, yeah, uh, then figure out which is the best one. I do lots of variations on titles as well. So I'll, I'll write down like a, like a list of titles of the talk and think, okay, that's it, yeah, that, that will do. Uh, because it's, it's like writing a good uh, tweet as well. You've got, you can't write a title that's like three paragraphs long. Be like quite concise. Has to fit on the on the on the front page of your presentation, at least. Just use emojis so you can fit loads more in. <laughs> emoji type. <laughs> All emojis. Yep. <laughs> use the emoji language. Isn't that uh, was that from Doctor Who? Like the second uh, episode of Doctor Who, the new series. They're doing the, like, they had the emoji language on the <laughs> robots. You should watch that. It's quite good. It was quite a good episode. Uh, yeah. And also, if, if you if you're uh, if you, or working with people, you can always ask other people what their uh, opinions are of your titles, what they actually mean, and if they like emojis or not. Um, there we go. Uh, so, some bad examples. Uh, just putting closed spec. Closed spec is awesome. Why is it awesome? I know why it's awesome, but why do you think it's awesome? Because you're giving the talk. You're going to tell us why uh, closed spec is awesome, or what I did with closed spec. Yeah, but what did you do? <laughs> um, I want to hear what you did, but I'd like to know what you actually did before I accept your talk or before I go and listen to your talk. Um, so you need to a little be a little bit more specific. So, um, and again, this is quite subjective. Feel free to disagree whether these are good titles or not. But if you do like effective testing with closed spec and generative testing, so obviously you're, you're talking about testing, you're talking about generative tests, gives you some more context about what you're actually trying to do working across. Uh, persisting data as an EDN types in Datomic. Um, okay, so we're dealing with Datomic, and what we're going to do with it, we're going to persist data, we're going to use EDN. That gives you a whole bunch of ideas about what it is it's going to be about, um, or how funding circles like adding developers into closure, or, um, yeah, or how, uh, how you switch as a polyglot. Uh, development environments, uh, et cetera, et cetera, these kind of things. Um, so it gives you enough to get you interested, uh, enough to at least want you to read the abstract, which is the main thing. And then the abstract will then get your talk accepted or get people to come to your talk. Um, uh, so I could have said some of this already. Don't repeat yourself, it's always a good one. Um, also, sometimes repeating yourself is quite good to summarize things. Um, I think I've covered all these already. So, you know, write down very variations. Uh, imagine it's just a blog type of you're writing if you're writing blogs. Um, 
Yeah. And once you've written the abstract, make sure your title actually still is relevant to the abstract you've actually written. I've done that before. I was like, oh, it's a really great title, and I start writing the abstract and I get lost in the abstract. Mm. Uh, okay, that's a different talk now. There we go. Because sometimes when you're writing the abstract, you realize you want to talk about something else than what you originally wanted to talk about when you wrote the title. Uh, it does happen. It happens to me quite a lot. Might be just me. Um, we could do an exercise if you wanted to. Do you want to do an exercise? Yes. Yes. Um, you, might, you will need laptops for this. Um, or we could use the, actually, we could use the whiteboard. Do you want to use whiteboard or laptops? Okay. It's interactive. Didn't want to do the exercise. You don't really want to do exercise. We can do. We, don't, we can do a few. No, I did, yeah, five five, do five minutes. Exercise. You don't have to do this. You don't want to participate. That's that's different. Let's do the whole school. Oh. Oh. Um, so just uh, come up and if you like a title of a talk that you want to give or. If you're not sure about what title, one, like a title of a talk that you would like somebody else to give. Um, and there's plenty of pens there. So have a think, as soon as you think of an idea, and these are any idea, even if it's just like, you don't know how to write the title, just write the idea up, and then we can create a title from that as well. So the idea is not to craft the perfect title, it's just to put a title up there so we can see whether, whether we think it's a useful title and how we would fix it. So it's an idea of, it's an exercise in creating a good title out of whatever we've written on board, assuming we don't agree that's a good title. Let's go. Yes. Thank you. What are we do? Are we going to else? Anybody want more feedback on this? Anybody like, who likes it? Who hates it? See, nobody <laughs> says bad <laughs> things about <laughs> 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 it. Nobody ever admits it. Nobody ever admits it. Thanks for the feedback. So, so. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's nicely structured. It's just whether whether it has enough detail in. I think it's the only you know, thing I I think about. Um, how REPL driven development helps me write better code. Uh, any thoughts on this? Any comments? Who thinks it's good? Who thinks it's terrible? <laughs> no, you could say <laughs> content's good, but I think it should be better code with REPL. because uh, it helps me, which is, it, it's good in a way because it says, it's me, it's about me, it's how I did it, it's my experience, it's my real life story, not something I've just made up, what it could be, but mm -hmm. it's more likely that is. Um, and so this is kind of like a nice, kind of, it indicates an experience report, I kind of think. Uh, but if you also put you instead, uh, then it kind of encourages that, you, well, you can do it. it, invites you to be able to say, well, this is something that's going to be applicable to you as well. And I don't think, I mean, in this context, I mean, either would kind of work. Or if um, if you work for some well-known company like Google or Uswitch, uh, not that I'm saying Uswitch is awesome, but, um, but they, they are hiring people. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, but yeah, but giving a, a name of a company that like uh, that means something to the audience or means something to the organisers is is a useful thing as well. So if you put um, uh, super work with Cognitech, not like to spell uh, uh, there, then again that's appealing to the organisers. It's also appealing to people who might want to come because it's how they do it. It's how like the, the experts do it, kind of thing. Um, so just kind of changing that one word to kind of make like subtle differences in what you actually get across as well. Um, yeah, I quite like, uh, yeah. Um, or you can do uh, how, uh, how Cognitech write better code with REPL driven development. It's nice and punchy, but it also is like experience report, but also from the experts as well. Um, so yeah, cool. Any other ideas? What else have we got? Oh, we've got the 
the lungs with the small writing. Sorry, that, that's me writing big. That's all right. Cool. It's, uh, I can read it. Uh, returning to the monolith. I like, I like that. That's interesting. Mm. Uh, rapid change by shrinking deployment size. Something. Okay. Mm. So uh, that re returning to the monolith. Uh, uh, it, it's quite punchy. Quite, it's like a nice hook into something because mm. uh, everybody knows about monoliths and they deep. Why do you want to return to monolith? All, all the microsystems talks are all in vogue. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. So I'm surprised you didn't put microservice in there as well. Yeah. Um, return. Return. Yeah. By, by microservicing. Micro. micro uh, yeah. Like that. Something like that. Yeah. Um, but you're actually. Yeah. You're actually kind of. Being a bit more specific here about, uh, yeah, we're going to shrink the deployment size. Um, so what I mean there is uh, the project I'm on. Uh, thing the project I'm on was it w had small services for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. And uh, like, oh, this is crazy. We wrote in Scala in one thing, and it's yes. a monolith, and now we can change it like this, where it used to take a week of effort to make any change. Yeah. Yeah. It's something. Yeah. So you can make that. Um, yeah. Yeah, rapid change by uh, by reducing the deployment size, that kind of thing. So I, th I think mm. maybe just the wording a little bit there, but I mean the, the idea of that. So mm. like, yeah. Um, although when I first read this, I, I kind, of, kind of took it quite negative in the fact that yeah, you're kind of returning to the monolith by doing microservices, which again people do as well, um, uh, by, by creating all of these microservices, they're effectively just creating a big monolith. <laughs> um, uh, but just more distributed. Distributed. <laughs> distributed <laughs> uh, and there are, there have actually been conference talks like that yeah, on the exact topic as well. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it could be read, I think, in, in several different ways, which sometimes is good anyway. It doesn't have to be, um, you can kind of have a little bit of a reveal saying, have something that's really interesting. You've got a hook there returning to the monolith, which is, mm. can be seen both positively and negatively, but it will bring you in regardless. And then when you read the abstract, the abstract then codifies what you actually mean. Are you saying this is a good thing or this is a bad thing? And then what and if it's a bad thing then what, what do you then you explain what you're doing about it in the abstract as well. Um, any other questions, comments? People like this yes, people like monoliths. Because <laughs> they know about yeah. it. They know what a monolith is, they can relate to it and they, they know what we want to know what to do about it because we've all had a monolith in our life. Unless <laughs> 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 we're, we're, we're very lucky. Oh, yeah. like a thing which could make people discuss to each other about such things. So it's like engaging. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. It's a really, yeah, it's a really good discussion. Oh, it's there. I might do it. Um, from Apache Pig to Apache Spark, writing custom ag aggregators. Um, so this is quite, I think it's quite nice, obviously if it's a, a Spark conference or a conference where people are using Spark, it's a nice kind of way to kind of move from one thing to another. Um, so um, I think what I'm curious about is like, well, how or why? So is, is this talk about why would you use it, move from there or, or why would you use it? I mean, you're, you're talking about how you're going to do it, I guess, with custom aggregators. So if it's a... Is that something that's part of Spark? It's part of Spark, so it's hidden. That's the thing that I still don't know why. Right, okay. Right. Yeah. So if it's, uh, if it's kind of a conference around Spark, then people are going to know what this is. Like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. That's interesting. I've, I've, we use uh, Hadoop uh, before. We want to kind of use uh, Apache Spark now. So it helps us move that. So it means something for them like quite specific. So that, that works for that kind of context. If it's just a more general talk, then you might have to kind of elaborate a bit more, but I think for a specific conference that's quite nice, quite nice from there. Any other comments? I feel like it might be missing a word. I, the ambiguity for me between from Apache Pig to Apache Spark, is that migrating from, or yeah. is it yeah. about both, then I'm going to talk about everything in between? Yeah, yeah that's a good point, actually. Yeah. 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 Well, well in context, it's migrating for sure, because Apache Pig yeah. kind of yeah. 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 I And I know what they are, and yet I still thought you were going to talk about them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could. I mean, you could actually just take off the from and say Apache Pig uh, to, uh, yeah. Yeah. Or to Apache Spark uh, by 
confronting this mega get just does kind of also convey to people who know what these are and, and, and if these mean well that's what you're doing they're going to help you migrate then yeah you, you don't need to be as explicit but in a gen more general conference then you probably need to be yeah, I'm migrating from uh, pig to so you could migrate from pig to spark using custom aggregators or Apache pig to spark um, then yeah you might elaborate a little bit more on that mm -hmm. uh, oh Oh, we got look ma, look ma, no macros. Defining and using macros. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but that kind of like made me sit and take notice. That's the point. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> that's the point. Uh, so you're saying, look, it's like uh, the king is dead, long live the king, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. um, it, it kind of it grabs your attention. It sounds like a fun and interesting talk. Uh, so you're going to submit this one? Yeah? No. No, just, no, 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 no. I actually saw this on Twitter in Slack. Okay. Oh. 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 Yes. But it's always, it, it is always good to review like uh, what other people have submitted to conferences as well. And no, what's been it accepted. wasn't it was just, just random so accepted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll just give you an internet for a step. So yeah, so yeah, yeah, we do a talk about that. Um, yeah, it, I think it's quite nice because it, it, it's catchy. Um, it, it very succinctly tells you what it's going to talk about, so we're going to define and use macros. Um, uh, so I can think for a, like uh, it's a nice kind of talk on the subject of macros, um, and it's kind of a nice introductory talk into macro, macros. I think uh, if you were going to do a deeper talk, then you might want to kind of change the title around a bit, be more, more specific what you're going to cover. Things like the, the pros and cons of macros, or some kind of like a, yeah, um, the long dark road to macro hell, that kind of thing, um, which <laughs> is obviously saying how how cautious you should be if you're going to write your own macros, which again is another interesting talk. Um, that way. Um, cool. Any other feedback comments? Um, I guess it completely depends on the context of the talk. It might be useful for me to know what language. I can guess that's probably Toja. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but it could be yeah, anything. It would have quite a big impact on yeah. if it was Toja or C++. Probably that's true, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if this was, uh, if this was Proxicon, um, then yeah, it, what's macro? Uh, if it's London Closure Conference, then obviously we know that context there as well. Uh, and obviously that does kind of shape the you're going to come up with whatever conference you come up with, um, then uh, it does shape your uh, what you can get away with uh, a lot more as well. Do you find that useful? Yes, mm -hmm. cool. Excellent. Uh, what else have we got? Oh, really good abstracts. It's kind of more of the same, uh, really, I guess, um, except you're taking the title and going into more detail, obviously. Um, Again, this also feels very kind of common, common sense, but actually doing it, actually talking about it and doing it are two different things, as you've just seen with the titles. Um, and so, yeah, covering what you're going to learn, um, and uh, who's it for, uh, why it's valuable to learn, uh, to learn about this sort of stuff. So, again, this gives clues to the organizers of a conference or a meetup, but also the audience as well, and it helps them decide what they're really going to see. Uh, they'll probably read the they read the abstracts, they might read it a couple of times when they're like, deciding what kind of things they're going to go and see. Sometimes the title will just grab them and say, oh, okay, that's a great title, I'm going to go for that. Uh, most of the time they'll look at the abstract and think, oh, okay, that's that's what the, the talk's about, that's what I want to see, or that's, you know, maybe, or no, nah, I don't want to see that. So it does help uh, people understand what so I try and be quite strict, descriptive. I don't think there's any kind of rule about how big the abstract should be. I typically, uh, I mean, we do a lot of these things for work. We have a conference where we have like over 300 people from the community speaking, and so we go through an awful lot of uh, abstracts there. Um, and um, for those ones, when there's a huge amount, I mean, I, I kind of have a, a have a three paragraph structure that I use so it's kind of 
expand, the first paragraph expands on the title and says, well, this is what the talk's all about um, uh, and why, why you should come listen to it. The second title is kind of like, what's why it's really valuable. It goes into a bit more detail about uh, what we're doing. And the third one is just like summarizing um, yeah, what you'll get out of it and who, who it's kind of there for as well. And so cover, covering these kind of things and what kind of, if there's any kind of specific skill, uh, skill level or any prerequisites that you actually need as well. But you can make it a lot longer. Um, what did I do with my, uh, let's go and look and see if probes. already gone, so it doesn't matter now. Oh, wow. um, uh, oh here we go. Uh, this is me. So uh, a bit of a hook. Uh, Taming of the Wild Frontier, uh, Adventures in Closure Script. So this was quite a sort of general program programmers conference. Um, if this was Closure X, I'd probably want to specify what my adventures were. But the idea I was trying to get across was uh, like JavaScript is the scary crap. Uh, and just a crazy outlaw, uh, wild west kind of thing, and you should use closure script because it's much easier. <laughs> uh, <laughs> whether I can bear that or not is a different question. So I've got quite a big abstract here, because I, I wanted to cover, because it's a general purpose um, conference, I wanted to cover quite a few different uh, bits. Um, so my abstract here is like building a modern, um, so I'm basically saying here, what's wrong with JavaScript? Uh, you never know when something's gonna bite you, um, which is kind of a little bit negative towards uh, JavaScript. Um, I wasn't, the intention wasn't to bash the hell out of JavaScript, but just kind of raise um, kind of concerns about it, enough to kind of get you to want to have a look at a different language. Because if you're a JavaScript developer, um, you kind of know like the good parts and the bad parts of language, but you might not want to admit that enough to go and want to have a look at something else. People like languages and they stick with languages. Uh, they, some people get very precious about languages. I'm certainly not precious about closure at all, quietly, uh, maybe a little bit. Um, and then I go on to explain uh, uh, there's an alternative. There's an alternative called closure scripts, which is uh, well designed, so kind of nodding to the fact that um, yeah, closure script uh, was like designed over 60 years, 50 years, 60 years, because it's basically Lisp, um, compared to JavaScript, which was 10 days, a little, a little extra. Um, and, and so these are the kind of things I kind of do bring up in the presentation. And it's just to get people, again, thinking it's these talking points, not uh, But uh, yeah, and then it, this is quite a, uh, an extensive kind of abstract. Uh, so then I go on. Uh, so this abstract is basically like covering all the, the aspects of closure script. Why it's nice. It's a dynamic nature of closure script. Lots of interactive, rapid prototyping. Um, and we've got uh, uh, people don't like the fact that it's not. Type. So people who like their types, we kind of cover this idea of. Got a built-in specification library and generative testing, which kind of helps you uh, build a robust website. Which people who are using uh, very type-heavy languages like uh, Haskell and Clojure might be wary of a dynamically typed language, so they wouldn't want to use it. But we're giving them at least a hook potentially into why they want to come and listen to this instead. Um, we're saying it's extremely fast, uh, optimized. Uh, it's, it's Generating optimized JavaScript to dead code elimination. It's, it's it's kind of people are giving people a sense that it's generating JavaScript, so they know kind of what to do with it. Um, and then we kind of dip into kind of state management uh, and immutable data structures as well. We have got kind of a couple of paragraphs there, so we've gone into quite a lot of detail because the the talk itself went into all these kind of various aspects as well. Uh, hence the end of slides. Uh, 45 minutes. Um, and then why the immutable approach is, uh, is 
Moneyball, uh, and then yeah, just um, kind of if people want to, if people have got this far as well, just saying it's easy enough for you to do, um, uh, it's a joy to use. So again, encouraging them to try it, make, make it feel a little bit more accessible to them as well. And then we've got the, the buzzword bingo down the bottom, which I think um, I think the conference put them on as well. This is quite a long one. Um, but it does cover in quite a lot of details uh, is what people feel about this, any comments? You can criticise the hell out of it, I don't care. I've already given it now. I don't have to worry about it. In your first sentence, I wonder how you feel about saying with, Java, uh, with JavaScript can feel like being an explorer in a wild project. That mm. way you're, may, you're offering them the chance to go, oh yeah, I'm fine with it. That, that's a really good uh, point, actually. Yeah, I, sh I should have done that, really, because uh, one of the comments I did get was uh, somebody, somebody did get the feeling that I was bashing JavaScript developers, mm. which I didn't, didn't really mean to. Um, but yes. So You're very big and clever. Uh, yes. I can um, it in my head. Nobody, nobody left. So. <laughs> uh, in fact, well, actually, in fact, the guy that did make that comment was not able to leave because he was actually doing helping one of the volunteers, so you have to stay in the room. <laughs> but he, 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 he did really like my talk as well. <coughs> Any other comments? Um, the parts would be better in bullet point. I'm just thinking if, if a conference organizer is having to read 80 CFPs. Oh, yeah. Um, this, is, this is a long one, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, and I think I have done something like that before. Um, so this is a conference where I, I was I was invited to speak, so I didn't have to go through the C CFP. Um, they just said send us send us an abstract and we'll just publish it. I'm really okay. <laughs> crazy. Um, I think if I go and do look at uh, DevOps UK, um, oh, there we go. Uh, what's on the speakers? Interesting closure scripts and reactive apps. So this is a um, this is a Java conference, and so um, I've kind of I've kind of simplified it. it. I'm not trying to compare it to JavaScript because uh, if people have used JavaScript, they're probably using that uh, as like their second language or not. They they probably consider their main language to be Java. So there's a slightly different focus there. Um, Although I'm kind of using the same kind of thing there because yeah, a lot of people come from Java and they see JavaScript and they get hung up on uh, what's prototype inheritance. I don't really understand that because they're using class inheritance and it's it's the same but it's very different um, and uh, it, it confuses them as well. Uh, so I've kind of used again uh, the same comment. I could have uh, yeah can feel like I think is a is a nicer refinement. Um, but I think I'm, so this is a little bit shorter, but uh, and it's talking more about reactive apps as well because uh, reactive is a nice buzzword, and if you're in a big conference, it's always nice to stick in a nice buzzword uh, that people will accept. Um, I think I'm, I'm sure a lot of people get their talks accepted because they can put microservices in the title as well, which is crazy. I'll have to do. <coughs> yes. If anybody wants to submit a, uh, a, a something with microservices to the ClojureX conference, then I, we probably would accept that as well. As <laughs> <laughs> but if everybody does, then we'll probably only accept one so, or two. But yeah, it's, uh, I, think so, well, I think we did actually, we did have that kind of, we had like a serverless Lisp, uh, somebody did last year. So using Lisp on the, on the red. Yeah, that was great. And I think uh, we've had somebody, I've seen some, Closure conferences where they yeah they've done closure scripts on uh, AWS Lambda, so yeah it's and that thing's generally interesting because you're tying that up to yeah the, the language people are interested in but deploying that in a different way to what people are expecting. Um, you probably don't want to do closure on um, AWS Lambda, but closure scripts with a really fast startup time then I think that's got a lot of promise there as well. So it's definitely 
things. And, and our conference, our closure exit conference, is kind of nowadays it's 50% closure, 50% closure scripts. Um, in terms of the lack, in terms of the talks that distinct that make that kind of distinction. But that so that kind of length abstract, you think that's um, about right? Yeah, I, I've done shorter. I mean, I've done kind of um, I've done ones that are if you just take that big chunk out. In fact, I've done ones that are if you deleted that size, I've done ones that are kind of that kind of thing. So it's kind of like a I'm not going to use the, the full word. It's like a sandwich kind of thing. You kind of give them expand on the title and then um, uh, who should, should go. This is aimed at kind of uh, developers. If it's more, if it's a general com uh, conference, you kind of need to define your audience. Uh, if it's a one track kind of thing, then yeah, who cares? Uh, you're not going to have to sit there and watch it anyway. So, mm -hmm. um, so then you can focus more. If you know who the audience is, you can just focus on. If it's obvious, you can just focus on the actual explaining the title, what it means, what you're actually going to say, the story you're actually going to tell, uh, yeah, in that respect. Uh, any questions so far? Just a little wake. Oh, um, let's see, uh, I'm not going to make the right abstract because I think it takes a while, unless you really, really want to. No, no, there we go. That's right. feedback <laughs> last, yes. Um, there we go. So, but I do uh, suggest you practice uh, abstracts as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I do practice, 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 uh, and then practice some more, and then practice some more. I re write and re I rewrite all my abstracts every single time. Even if I kind of give the same talk at the same conference, I'll probably go through and rewrite the abstract a little bit, tweak it a bit. You can see, we've got some feedback there. I've got a better idea about how to tweak things as well. Um, so you're never going to get the perfect abstracts. You know, it's going to be something you want to change it, but yeah, as soon as it's good enough, then you can send it in. Um, I think I have sent in two, two abstracts where I kind of submit the same talk, but with a better abstract, because like a few days later, I just thought something, oh, this is so much better. Let's hope the new version gets accepted. I think I did put a comment in saying, I've already submitted this, but this is a much better. Accepted the yeah the second one. What would be hilarious if they accepted both. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same one. Well then yeah then then, then I would not have no problem you know, not accepting the first one. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, so writing a bio, writing a good bio, short to the point. Again, I, this is why I kind of like using my Twitter bio because you've only got a short amount of space on there. Um, you can write a bigger one. I think. Uh, I think the Proxcon, they, they grabbed my, oh, that's fine. The, the Proxcon thing, they they grabbed my, uh, my LinkedIn thing, which is really long. Uh, really, 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 yeah, so that's, uh, that's my LinkedIn one. So I think for like a really big conference, having a, uh, if you want to kind of get on the circuit, having like a big uh, bio, LinkedIn or something like that is, is quite handy. And have it somewhere like LinkedIn because then you can just copy and paste it or say just use my LinkedIn thing or just use my Twitter. Because that way um, yeah, people can just grab it and stick it on the site. Uh, whereas I think for most conferences I tend to just use the Twitter um, thing here. But yeah, so that's, that's my Twitter um, thing. So I just basically just copy and paste it. And then, yes? That's, that's not the um, I don't, to me it doesn't matter, I think some people, um, I tend to do it, uh, I guess it, I guess it does, gets done more third person, usually, it's more, it's more of a formal approach to do it third person, um, I think it, if it's a big conference then you'd probably do it more likely to do it third person, so you'd be talking about yourself rather than saying, I, I'm awesome, if it's first person, then John is awesome, the third person, I think that's right. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it is, I think it's a slightly trickier to speak, it's a little bit weirder speaking about yourself in the third person. Um, this is, um, I don't even know if this is like a person or not, it's like 
not really third person, it's just the fact. Yeah. So it says loves closing, which kind of makes it third person. Not yeah, I guess it does, yeah. Apart from that. Yeah, that's my nod to third person. First, yeah, so basically wrote this, realized it didn't fit, and then tripped up all the words <laughs> I could do to make it fit. Um, I do a few things. Um, and I wanted to get, so this one is, I guess the, the, the first part is um, what I do uh, and how I do it. Uh, so I, I, I do a whole bunch of things in the community and that's how I kind of drive a lot of the things I do. Uh, and then specifically, what do I, what gets me up in the morning, so closure, Emacs, Space Max was too big to fit in there, but Emacs is close enough. Um, uh, plus, I guess a few more people know Emacs, uh, Space Max, cats, because I've got cats. Although people, um, I wonder if anybody ever thinks that's category theory. Potentially. Especially people from the Scala world, they love the category theory. Because um, <laughs> uh, every, every time they come to Hack Metal, they go, oh, should we do cats? Yeah, yeah, let's do cats. Yeah, yeah. Which is cool. I love that. Um, uh, and then this just adds a bit of, uh, yeah, a bit more kind of personal kind of things without being too waffly. And it's, for me, a bio, it, I think it's quite nice to be consistent with your bio as well. To just have one, don't keep changing your bio. You might want to tweak the odd word, but um, it kind of like, if your bio is the same on the website as it's on Twitter or on social media stuff, then people know that they're on the right, uh, it's the right you. Especially if you've got like a, if you've got a long name like I, I have, then John Stevenson's quite a long Twitter handle. John was gone ages ago before. I did it, so I, I kind of, well, what, what can I do instead of Stevenson, uh, Stevenson's Rocket, oh, Rocket, there we go, um, and then I do Java, or I did do Java at the time, I see how long I created my Twitter handle, uh, and uh, my first name's John, so like, let's make it J Rocket, uh, oh, that's taken, oh, let's do J Rocket with a zero. Oh, that's not taken, <laughs> yay, there we go. Uh, so that's how, and then I, I use the same image on here as I've got on Twitter, Twitter, uh, Jay Rockets. Just in Bebo, <laughs> where did that come from? Now you, you know all my secrets. <laughs> I, I'm on Justin Bieber's site every day. So it's got the same picture as me. Um, it's got a big cat on there. Um, I did have a picture of Emacs on there as well with some closure, but it wasn't a very good picture, so I might need to redo that as well. So people can. Uh, yeah. also, uh, this is quite funny. Uh, Theresa May is uh, a perfect case. To uh, go and read that, it's quite funny. Um, yeah, I, occasionally I do tweak it, but generally it's, it's more or less the same. Um, and so that way, when somebody kind of finds me on Twitter, it's kind of it's the same. They know it's the same John Stevenson. It's quite a common name, so it just helps them find me and tweet about me and give me feedback. Really, so if they can find me, they can give me feedback uh, because people don't like to kind of come up to strangers and give them feedback, so they sometimes prefer to do it online as well. Uh, I think we've covered the bio things already here. Uh, oh, great and effective. So, I mean, the bio kind of like, also my Twitter, which I just closed. Uh, there's, uh, there's links to my, um, links to my blog here as well. I'm not, I wasn't born in 1996, <laughs> 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 in case you're wondering, uh, but that was my birthday, um, there we go. Um, and so yeah, so it's got my website on there as well, so it links to my other persons here. Um, and again, it's using the same domain as my uh, Twitter, and also everything's got jrocket, jrocket.co.uk, if you want to email me, it's john at jrocket.co.uk. Um, and so it's, yeah, people know who I am online as well, so again, they can contact me and give me feedback. What uh, do you use to, to make the website? Uh, I, I'd like to use a, a closure or a closure script, uh, static site generator, but at the moment it's a JavaScript uh, thing called Hexo, mm -hmm. although it doesn't seem to be very well maintained, so um, it works, but if it ever stopped working, I'd be, I'd be You'd have to go to JavaScript to fix it. Yeah, I've kind of dabbled. I, I might actually do the CSS to change all the all the look and feel for all these little things on here. But I, I wouldn't really want to 
do too much of that anymore. Um, I probably wouldn't put the London enclosure in one. But I also use something called uh, I use something called uh, Gitbook, which I do these workshops as well. Um, so I've got a slight, I've got an additional brand of uh, practically uh, with an I instead of a Y because that domain had gone as well. Uh, but Liechtenstein came through, um, so it's practical.li. Um, uh, and this is Gitbook. Yeah. This just helps me kind of. Uh, uh, it's connected to my YouTube channel, which is JRocket at YouTube, I think, as well. Um, uh, yeah, so I go to YouTube. And it's me. Uh, oh, there we go. Just the instant on there. So you can find me. Again, it's got. Oh, it's got the cat on there as well. There we go. It's got the cat. It's got my image. So it's having this kind of like consistent online presence. is. It's not essential, but it, it's kind of. It, it gives people, especially conference organizers that are meetup organizers, some idea of who you are, what you've done, uh, are they even, uh, do they really exist? Are they just a, figment, or just a figment of somebody else's email that they sent through? Um, yeah, so it does help. Uh, yeah, and you can see me, where can you see me speaking? Uh, so I've got a play, public playlist of me uh, speaking as well, which I'm not going to play because it's for work. And I've got a really bad hairstyle on that one. Um, but there you go. Uh, so it gives us gives a like this nice consistency, I think, uh, to your online presence, which is quite nice. So it's a nice it's a nice thing to have. Uh, I think even my LinkedIn is LinkedIn uh, slash J Rocket um, as well. So uh, again, it just makes it easy if a recruiter wants to find me and try and hire me for uh, some cool company in London. Uh, then they, it's a lot easier for them to do so. Uh, and I'm not going to make it right by who, who does have Twitter just out of curiosity. Let's see. There we go. So if you don't have a, a bio on your Twitter, I'd start there. Or if you do have one, start there and, and see if it fits. And, and then that's a default bio. If you want to write more, then again, you can write something on LinkedIn. Just use your LinkedIn to kind of have a bigger, <laughs> more, more corporate or kind of bigger conference uh, uh, bio if you want. But even at bigger conferences, people just still have short bios as well. Uh, any questions so far? We're still awake? Cool. Uh, we're speaking at London Closure. Anybody want to speak at London Closure yet? Have I convinced anybody that they could speak yet? <laughs> Out of curiosity, maybe not. People are still thinking. Um, So the, we'll, we'll come back to that at the end. Uh, I think actually just going to meetups uh, and listening to other people speak. Um, when you're doing that, you can also see how they're speaking as well, what you like about the way somebody's speaking. Um, I learn from other people doing stuff. So it's the same, and I'm sure you do, it's the same for speaking as well. Um, if somebody's uh, somebody's like talking and all they're doing is doing this, and, and, and never really looking at the audience. I'm thinking, why did it? Why don't they look at us? If if you find it annoying, then you probably shouldn't do it yourself when you do it. Because uh, it's I try not to do that as well. Even though I just did it for parody's sake. But actually, like looking at the slides when you should be talking to you're talking to the audience. You're talking to people, so you need to kind of show them some respect. Actually, being face to face when you're talking to them. Uh, and if all you're doing is kind of looking at what Martin Sparks wrote but on next. Um, it kind of, it also gives you, gives the audience an impression you don't really know what you're talking about as well, because you're, you're reading off the slides, and it's a lot more likely you will just read off the slides. Um, so if ways to combat that is to be at or near your laptop, you can see what's on the slides. If you've got speaker notes, you can kind of do the presentation on here and speaker notes on there. You can see what the slide is next. Uh, at big conferences, sometimes you'll have uh, a monitor or a screen down there, which is quite nice. So you can see uh, what's going on. We should we should do that for uh, closure action. So you can see what's actually coming next, or you can see what you're actually what the slide is behind you, in front of you. So you don't have to turn around. You can just glance down there, which is better than uh, showing everybody your uh, posterior. Uh, creating a content. Uh, oh, yeah, 
content. So just a few slides about going through and actually creating some content. So assuming you're you're actually going to go and speak, uh, you can do a uh, traditional slide approach, which I've done here, which is, this is probably not a very good example because lots of bullet points and, and things like that as well. But um, if you pick a nice theme, I don't really like the, um, the kind of like the, the Prezi style things where they kind of zoom in and zoom out. Like it was interesting the first time. Has anybody seen a Prezi presentation? Yeah. You kind of zoom in and zoom out and swirl around. And all looks fun fancy, but if you see too much of it, you feel a bit dizzy. Like, whoa. And it kind of it loses me a little bit. Um, I do have, I do sometimes use these uh, slides, which is, um, uh, where's the one? There we go. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, which got some animation on. And um, kind of, it kind of it gives a little bit, kind of just keep the audience kind of awake, but not too much, not too many spinning flying cubes all over the place. Um, and uh, obviously, I'll, I'm going through this quite quickly, so it's quite, uh, you know, but it's a nice kind of simple like JavaScript tool. And the nice thing about this is you can you can use this in, in any browser. You don't have to have uh, PowerPoint installed. Or like that, so it's fairly lightweight. Uh, so that's uh, that's just reveal JS. Or if you uh, if you read my blog, uh, you can find out how to do reveal JS from org mode mm -hmm. in Emacs, which is nice. Um, if you don't know what org mode is, then it's just a it's just an Emacs thing. It's just, an Emacs thing. <laughs> <laughs> just the thing that Emacs does to change the world or my world. Anyway. But I quite like, actually quite like, and I used to, I went really off slides, and then uh, I found Google Slides, and they're, they're, they're fairly simple. Some of them are crazy. I don't really like um, all the kind of animation and stuff like that, unless you're doing something very specifically visual. If you're doing like a diagram that moves and things in, then maybe you can do some animations as well. I did think about doing some like 3D you know, animation or 2D animation, and just having that as a as like an image or a video. But I think only only when you're actually trying to show some concept where visualizing the process actually makes sense. But otherwise, I, I prefer to keep them nice and clean because it, it, it's, if you don't get it right, it, it makes something more confusing than anything else. I think. Does so the slides just, work off, in offline? Uh, yeah, so if you're going to use uh, an online thing, then I would, uh, if you're going to write it in Google Slides, the nice thing about Google Slides is you can collaborate with other people. It works pretty well there, but if you're going to uh, do it at a conference, then you can always download it as a PDF or, uh, or PowerPoint or whatever else, or a series of images as well. If you do have the slides open and you lose internet connection, you can continue going through them. They're right. all available. Yeah. You can't reload the page, but it will continue to work. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's like a, a single page app. So, um, yeah, as long as you don't try and reload it, it works fine. Um, but yeah, I always recommend like downloading a PowerPoint or a, um, a PDF version of it anyway, just in case. Sometimes it just gets a bit slow and it's like really frustrating. Um, you can do, uh, yeah, so I've done workshops. I've done workshops with Getbooks. I think that's what I'll be doing with the, um, uh, with the DevOps talk. It's just going through uh, a workshop and actually just Using this as an example of, of building things. Ooh, it's called Space Max. There we go. Oh, there's this Space Max. Uh, there's uh, a Punch Grid one. There we go. So I'll be going through something like this. I'll be yeah, showing people how to uh, show them the syntax <coughs> and, um, and then some examples. And we're just basically walking through um, like projects and showing people how to build it and building it live in front of them. I haven't actually finished all this yet. Yeah, so this one is yeah, it walks you through like creating a ring handler. So I walk through this. I explain like the, the specific uh, content here, what a handler is, uh, and then we can build it, uh, add it to the code base that we've been working on, uh, and so that way I, we can do some live coding, but I don't have to remember all the code. 
it's all there. Um, in fact, I think, uh, yeah, I also put in little sections here where, oops, I've missed this one up because I read the code. But yeah, you have a, a GitHub branch or a GitHub tag uh, that you can say, well, if you, if you screw it up, then just go to this, check out the project and go to this tag and that'll take us to exactly where we are in the project, so you can continue from there. Or you can just, if, if somebody didn't want to actually write all the code out, they can just read the code and, and run it at different tags as well. I used to use branches for GitHub, so you'd have like a start with a master branch, and then when I create a new section, I create a new branch. Um, or you can just have one uh, branch, and you can just basically tag all the bits, all the kind of commits that you want just jump between the tags. And you don't have to worry about being in a headless state in GitHub, you don't have to worry about those messages. Uh, but yeah, having a GitHub project is a nice way to go through uh, a code base as it evolves going through a workshop. That's, uh, 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 and, uh, and live demos, anybody done any live coding? Excellent. Did you enjoy it? It was nerve-wracking. Yeah. I, th I think you need to... Uh, it's not, I wouldn't recommend doing a live coding session as your first thing. Uh, it, it does... Um, uh, showing the code and, and having something working, yes. You should definitely include... If it's a technical conference and you're talking about a programming language, you should definitely show off the programming language in action. Um, for example, with, with Clojure and Clojure Script, you're quite lucky because you can fire up a REPL and you can do things in the REPL and have things commented out. Um, and um, in fact, uh, for Clojure, I, I, I tend to use the, the reader macro, which is like the, the hash underscore. You can comment out an expression, but you can still go to the end of the line and evaluate that expression, even though it's commented out. And it'll, um, it won't, it won't run the expressions when you first start up your project, but you can then go in and uh, still evaluate the code uh, as and when it is. So that's quite a nice way to do that. Uh, I can show people at the end if they, uh, they want to see that specifically. Um, but live coding is, is quite uh, tricky, so um, you either do something very specific that you've done quite a few times before. Um, I've seen somebody doing, they basically did a, a coding dojo live with themselves. Uh, and with a little bit of audience interaction as well, but they were just like, I want to do this, and this is, so they're doing like, a, yeah, they're basically coding in front of people and explaining what they were doing and why they were doing it, what decisions they were making with the language, but you can kind of tell they've done that a few times, probably dozens of times, if not hundreds of times, because you kind of need to know what's, what you're going to do, or you have to be a really, really good developer to be able to do that, especially in front of an audience, to make it all look which is kind of the impression you initially gave, but then you kind of knew, you knew what was going on. Um, so if, going to, if you are going to do live coding, it is really impressive. Um, I tend to do live evaluation. So if I wrote a project, um, have the wrapper running, I can evaluate code and show people the results of that. Either if it's a closure script one, you can see the results in the browser. If it's a closure one, you can see things in the actual REPL itself. Um, it is a really powerful way to get your, your point across and uh, for people to see. There's no kind of doubt that you actually know what you're talking about if you're doing a live demo or live coding because it, it gives people real confidence that they it's real stuff, it's really happening, you're explaining what's happening. If it goes wrong and you fix it, then it's definitely real. Um, and uh, I've done that before. I think I was, oh yeah, I was doing a demo, this is for Heroku, and I was push my code through, and I said, okay, and now it's going to fire up. Um, and I said, oh no, it's failed. And, and the organizers looked at me, uh, and, and they were really worried because I thought I'd completely screwed up my talk. Mm -hmm. uh, and were about to kind of come up and say, oh no, I'll just look at the logs, and then fire up. Because I kind of made it fail intentionally because I, I deployed the code, but I hadn't fired up the database. And my code was trying to talk to a database, so I could, well, let's look at the logs. Oh, silly me, I forgot to add a database. Here's the database, boom. Oh, my application's working now. And everybody went, whoa, it broke and he fixed it all in like five minutes. And uh, so it did have a really powerful effect, although um, it did get a couple of the organizers a little bit like, oh, screwed up. <laughs> so, yeah.
So it, if you know what you're doing and you practice well, uh, it can be very powerful. But it does uh, it does take a lot of effort. Um, and having like Git or something in the background uh, to be able to do that. There's other kind of techniques was to have if you've got an editor, you can have uh, two separate windows, but with the same file in, uh, and you can you, you have separate displays. You can have so like with with Emacs, I can have a frame here and a frame there. It's a different frame, but it's got the same file in, and I can have another frame on my laptop, uh, which isn't on here. Where I just copy paste code into <laughs> there. Um, it is like oh look, I can magically create stuff. Uh, boom, it's a bit code there. Just see the tree. Uh, <laughs> And, and that way, I, I'm, it minimizes the risk of um, yeah, making a mistake, or making a mistake that you can't fix quickly. Because uh, the last thing you want to do is, is spend five minutes debugging your code in front of somebody. That's, that's quite painful for everybody. Um, I think if that does happen, you kind of have to resign the fact that uh, the demo gods have, uh, have not been kind today. Uh, let's move on to something else and talk about something else. Um, Unless, you, unless it's a very small group and you get invite them to kind of debug with you, um, uh, or unless it's something that's really obvious. But if the more time you spend on there, the more painful it actually gets to do a live demo. Do I encourage anybody to do a live demo? Let's get mm -hmm. around that. Yes. Uh, any questions so far? Yes. Uh, comment. You've also got to be careful about when you're giving it. Often at meetups, like skills matters good because yeah. it's always the same, but you've got to be careful what you do it. There was a presentation we tried to do functional works at one of uh, theirs. We are going to do some live coding and it was just like, laptops up there and you're going to be down here presenting it. But, okay, I don't do a live coding. <laughs> like, oh. a small part of the presentation, so I was like, no, it's fine, we can get on with it. We prepared for the fact that we might not be able to do that. Ah, yes. Yeah, that, that's that's a very good point, actually, yes. Um, one of the other things, um, it's a bit more inconvenient as, as well as uh, even if the laptop is there, but you've got a handheld mic. Uh, <laughs> that's really painful because like, you, know, you definitely, like, no matter how good a typist you are, like doing it one-handed is not. You can do live evaluation. You can do like uh, yeah, control X, control E with one with one hand. <laughs> so you can evaluate closure with one hand and speak the microphone in another. I know because I've done that. Um, and. Uh, yeah, if you learn that if you should keep on shortcuts, you can basically just jump to the end of the next expression quite quickly so you can get to the code. Um, but if you, as soon as you have to type, and now I'm typing some <laughs> code, and I wish I had a hands-free mic. Um, yes, I've had to do that, and it's, it's, not, it's not pretty. Uh, because as soon as you put the mic down, your ability to code quickly just disintegrates. Uh, and it, it does, that does kind of disintegrate for an audience as well. Uh, especially if you're trying to explain, so we try to, like next time you're doing some coding with somebody, like try and write some code and explain it at the same time. See how well you do it. Some people can do this, but not many. Um, it, it's one of those things where you can't do two jobs at once. Yeah. It's like um, it's if you give somebody uh, a maths problem, uh, then most people, uh, if, you, if you're walking along the street and you give somebody like a, a less than trivial maths problem. They actually actually stop walking to be able to work, work it out because they can't walk and do the maths in their head. Uh, a few people can, but most people can't do it. It's the same with typing and speaking as well. I can do it a little bit, but I, it's very either my ex explanation goes or my typing goes. I'm uh, usually somewhere in between. But with the evaluation, I can do that a little bit easier uh, because. I'm uh, I'm presenting your content. Oh yes, make sure people can actually see your slides. I'm not presenting that. Really. So I always kind of go to the put my slide and go to the back of the room. Can I see it? I see it. And I've got terrible eyesight, so if I can see it, then not obviously we're not when I'm presenting because that's not that great. It's a bit strange. Uh, but when you're setting up, um, especially with uh, very old Emacs. So Emacs is quite big uh, in this case, but if you've got um, you've got like really small font, like that, that's, uh, yeah, because it it looks perfectly fine on your screen, but 
the resolution on the, even if it's the same resolution, the, the, the actual scaling difference between your computer and, and presenting is, uh, is going to be different. So if you're going to do show some code, make sure people can actually read it. This is the one thing I get at work. Uh, you get like a bunch of people doing talks, but you can't see the code, or you're like getting the um, screenshots of the code or the code itself to be of a decent size, or screenshots of a page. Or people are doing demos in a, in a web page, and all the text is tiny, you can't really see what's going on. So um, it doesn't make for a very good demo if people can't see the details. People use the, the zooming function of your laptop to zoom into something, which is okay, but you still need to have a fairly big text on what you're displaying. You don't want to zoom in and out all the time because it just again confuses uh, confuses me as well. I'd ask the audience whether they can see it as well. It's a nice it's a nice uh, uh, icebreaker as well. It's a nice way to get people to give you some feedback that's fairly non-committal. Uh, it's a lot easier to ask for feedback about whether you can see something as to asking them a question. If you ask an audience a question, they'll think, no, I don't want to answer, I might get it wrong. Uh, but you can't really get it wrong with, can I see it? You either can or can't. Mm. Although, again, some people <coughs> will not say that they can't see it because they're a little bit shy uh, in the audience, but they can. But usually somebody will, yes. I try to find a link to it now, but there's a really good slide for testing like contrast ratios. Mm. You put the slide up, and then you yeah. can like, really check that the contrast ratios of the projector are actually oh, yeah. quite decent, yeah. which is something that often is applied to. Yeah, because I, I used to try different. So I usually use this theme now for um, for, e for space maps, but um, and then there's the dark themes. That's uh, uh, not so good, especially without light kind of being hitting the screen there. And um, on the default, uh, uh, the default kind of space map one is, yeah, it's not good. Um, sometimes you can switch the lights off the front and use the black screen. It, it does depend. Sometimes black screens are okay and sometimes they're just really bad. I, I find black, not dark text in the white background just works so much better on the projector. Yeah, yeah. Which is the opposite of what a lot of people like when they're coding on their yes. own sheet. Exactly, yeah, yeah. I used to do a lot of the, the screenshots uh, with just the default, and then I realized when I projected them, I couldn't see them, so I had to redo them all. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I, I did that with the, uh, I just, I redid all the ones in that I had with my presentation from uh, the other day. Um, so, I mean, I, if I'm just putting text in there, I'll colorize it a little bit, uh, and make it, and using a white background with uh, black or colored text, does stand out pretty well. Um, and then if I'm doing like copy pasting from the editors, I'm using uh, the white background as well, which uh, again seems to stand out pretty nicely. Uh, I might kind of get rid of the, uh, the backgrounds for these, I'm not quite sure. But yeah, it, it's, it looks a lot better than the black ones I had, which I think I have all gone now. But, uh, oh, there we go. Um, that's not too bad, but it's not 100%. It's the, uh, it's the brackets kind of disappear a lot in the back, back background. Back, black, bleh, in the background, there we go. In the dark background. Whereas the, the light ones are uh, a just, lot more obvious. Just the text isn't white, right? So it's, the yeah, contrast it's, it's is inherently got, lower. In yeah, if you've got so white text on a black background, that's, that's fine. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. But So you can see all the comments quite nicely. Even though they're kind of grey, but they're still white. Uh, an atom sticks on it. But if you got colours, and I didn't really want to switch off colours because I'm not sure how to do that. Um, but it was easier to uh, get the colours, still get the syntax highlighting, so it's a little bit easier to read. But yeah, using a, a white uh, or a light theme for your editor as well. And even when I'm doing live demos, I'll, I'll, I'll do that in the white theme as well. talk to the audience, it's always useful. You give me a presentation. Sounds pretty obvious. Um, but yeah, I think I alluded to this before. Like it's 
it, like, the last thing you want to do is turn your back on the audience <laughs> or, or ignore them. Um, and making, uh, making eye contact is, is quite useful because at that point it makes people a bit more engaged in that. Uh, stops them falling asleep in the back, in the corner there. Um, not really work, but, uh, it, uh, but also just like staring at them. If I stare at Chris for ages and ages and start talking to him, why, why is he looking at me? Why is he looking at me? Uh, it, it does get uncomfortable. Uh, because it means that you, uh, people think, well, he's talking about me now. Or like, why, why is he? It, it, it's, a bit, it's a bit creepy. So I think the, I think if it was a, if it's a really big room, like they say, like as a rule of thumb, you pick like a handful of people, and over the course of like half hour, 40 minutes, you kind of, you kind of look at the general direction of those handful of people. So you've got like three to five people you're looking at. And you're kind of switching between them in a kind of fairly regular kind of pattern, or you might kind of look just in that direction as well. And you're kind of making eye contact with people, and uh, you're, yeah, it makes them feel a bit more engaged uh, and uh, more likely to kind of listen to you, and also more likely to come and talk to you as well. They, they see you more of as a, uh, as a person rather than a speaker as well. Uh, So, um, yeah, somebody did ask me uh, what happens if only one person does turn up. And um, I don't think I've ever had that. Although I did run an event where only three people turned up, <laughs> which was interesting. Uh, it was interesting because it was three new people to the community and we were going to do a retrospective about what we did all last year and what we should do better. And, and they, they'd never been before, so we had to completely change up. Um, but with uh, if there's only one or two people, then yeah, you are just engaging with those two people. Uh, or if it's one person, if it's just Sam that turned up, I probably just sit uh, next to Sam with a laptop here, and we look at the presentation together, and we go through it, and we talk to each other just as a couple of people on the bus or something. Obviously, a quiet bus. <laughs> um, a quiet bus is nice without people throwing up all over the place. It's not a night bus. Um, that's not the last time I've been on the bus. Um, don't ramble, that's bad. Um, but yes, like talking when you talk to one person, yeah, just treat it like you treat, treat uh, like you talk to one person. Like go and sit with them as well and do stuff. And if you got a, if you're in like a bigger venue and you, you can't have your laptop there, if you have a clicker with you, you can just go through the slides that way, or just kind of ask them if they want to go to a different talk that you want to go and see that's at the same time as your talk. <laughs> Uh, avoiding nerves, yes. So let's, uh, are there any, that's about the, yeah, this is about the last slide. I think I want to spend a, uh, a few minutes on this to, uh, to see if you're still feeling nervous and just like wrap this up with a kind of general conversation about confidence and nerves and how we're all feeling about that sort of stuff as well. Uh, so, yeah, as I mentioned, everybody gets nervous. It's very natural. In fact, having nerves very beneficial. It makes you more. It makes you care more about what you're doing. I think. Um, if you, well, I, I think it means that you care more about what you're doing because you're. Um, if it wasn't important, you wouldn't be nervous about. It. Um, and if you didn't want to make, if you weren't worried about making a complete screw, up, you wouldn't be nervous. Um, and so, if if you are nervous, it means you do care about what you're about to do and you want to give like a good. You want to give a good demo to people, and uh, and so yeah, it, it hopefully encourages you to put enough effort in, so you will give a good talk. And I think if you if you prepared in whatever way you do prepare, because I think there's lots of different ways to prepare. People will uh, at rope just go over and over and over and over their slides until they know them in and out. Some people need to do that. Some people just need to have a good story in their in their mind. Um, I'm, I'm more the latter. I, if I know the story I want to tell, uh, even if I don't know all the words, I know kind of like the the overarching, like the, the story arc I want to give, then I feel confident because I know the, the rough conversation I want to have with people. Uh, and I've got enough slides, or possibly too many slides, uh, to be able to convey that story and it might take a few detours, and we might go off on a few tangents, like we've done in this a little bit. But uh, I, I know what I want to get over. I know what 
uh, is the information I want to uh, impart. I know what I want to encourage people to be thinking about and possibly doing by the end of it. So for this thing, I, yeah, the, the main motivation was to uh, to try and diminish some of the, the fears you have about speaking, uh, try and give you some tools to be able to kind of go out and speak, uh, and also try and get you to speak at closure meetups and closure conference as well. But no pressure. Um, so that's the kind of, and I kind of have that in my back of my mind as I'm kind of doing all these things and relating stuff as well. And then everything is kind of filled in by the slides and kind of drawing from my own experience to try and tell that story with some colourful examples. Hopefully that will make you uh, chuckle, if not if not to fall um, out loud as well. And so that by doing that, for me, that stops me getting nervous. And sometimes that happens, uh, I focus on the talk, I focus on continually like, working on the slides. Uh, I've, on several occasions, I've you know, been working on the presentation up until when I actually give it, which I don't advise, um, but it does stop you thinking about uh, what you're actually doing because you're so busy actually writing the content of your presentation, you don't have time to think about uh, what's going on. And another example uh, was uh, at last year's conference, uh, there was one speaker, it wasn't, wasn't Gabriel, she was very good. Uh, we, we spent time trying to fix our laptop, uh, which was a good distraction. Uh, a bit, a bit, a little bit nerve wracking that, because the laptop wasn't displaying uh, Quill when you presented it on an external screen. So we had a bit of fun and games we too. Seen, we we have the, the same issue on Clojure Bridge. Yeah. Right, so that we weren't doing that before on the conference, but it didn't. <laughs> yeah, we thought we fixed it, but we, we, <laughs> we had to turn it um, So we, we kept busy um, getting that going. I don't, did that help the nerves, or was it just a 